Oh hi, I'm the heretic. It's been too long since I did one of these, so let's get back into gear with a fun and slightly controversial Bible story. The best kind of Bible story. This one has everything. A condemnation of homosexuality, and everyone's favorite, God being a dick. The story of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah goes something like this. Angels find this guy, Lot, and they tell him to leave the city as they're about to destroy it because it's sinful. He gets his family out, but his wife looks back and she's transformed into a pillar of salt. Let's begin. The two angels arrived at Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gateway of the city. When he saw them, he got up to meet them and bowed with his face to the ground. My lords, he said, please turn aside to your servant's house. We can wash our feet and spend the night and then go on your way in the early morning. No, they answered. We will spend the night in the square. But he insisted so strongly that they did go with him and entered his house. He prepared a meal for them, baking bread without yeast, and they ate. Before they had gone to bed, all the men from every part of the city of Sodom, both young and old, surrounded the house. They called to Lot. Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us so we can have sex with them. Lot went outside to meet them and shut the door behind him and said, No, my friends, don't do this wicked thing. Look, I have two daughters who have never slept with a man. Let me bring them out to you so you can do what you like with them. But don't do anything to these men, for they have come under the protection of my roof. Get out of our way, they replied. This fellow came here as a foreigner, and now he wants to play the judge. We'll treat you worse than them. They kept bringing pressure on Lot and moved forward to break down the door. But the men inside reached out and pulled Lot back into the house and shut the door. Then they struck the men who were at the door of the house, young and old, with blindness, so that they could not find the door. The two men said to Lot, Do you have anyone else here, sons-in-law, sons or daughters, or anyone else in the city who belongs to you? Get them out of here, because we are going to destroy this place. The outcry to the Lord against its people is so great that he has sent us to destroy it. So Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law, who were pledged to marry his daughters. He said, Hurry and get out of this place, because the Lord is about to destroy this city. But his sons-in-law thought he was joking. With the coming of dawn, angels urged Lot, saying, Hurry! Take your wife and your two daughters who are here, or you will be swept away when the city is punished. Then he hesitated. The men grasped his hand in the hands of his wife and of his two daughters, and led them safely out of the city, for the Lord was merciful to them. As soon as they had brought them out, one of them said, Flee for your lives! Don't look back, and don't stop anywhere in the plain. Flee to the mountains, or you will be swept away. But Lot said to them, No, my lords, please. Your servant has found favor in your eyes, and you have shown great kindness to me by sparing my life. But I can't flee to the mountains. This disaster will overtake me, and I'll die. Look, there is a town near enough to run to, and it is small. Let me flee to it. It is very small, isn't it? Then my life will be spared. He said to him, Very well, I will grant this request too. I will not overthrow the town you speak of, but flee there quickly, because I cannot do anything until you reach it. That is why the town is called Zor. By the time Lot reached Zor, the sun had risen over the land. Then the Lord rained down burning sulfur on Sodom and Gomorrah, from the Lord out of the heavens. Thus he overthrew those cities, and the entire plain, destroying all those living in the cities, and also the vegetation of the land. But Lot's wife looked back, and she became a pillar of salt. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and returned to the place where he had stood before the Lord. He looked down toward Sodom and Gomorrah, toward all the land of the plain, and he saw dense smoke rising from the land, like smoke from a furnace. So when the Lord destroyed the cities of the plain, he remembered Abraham, and he brought Lot out of the catastrophe that overthrew the cities where Lot had lived. Wow, God's a dick, so let's unpack it. There isn't much context about Lot himself that is relevant to this Old Testament passage. I should mention that he is Abraham's nephew, but what kind of person Lot should be self-evident? He offered his daughters to a horny crowd for goodness' sake, and he was the one man whom the Lord sent his angels to save. I think there's an important lesson here, but I'll touch on that later. So what's going on here? Well, first the angels arrive, and Lot seems to recognize them immediately offering them hospitality and respect. They say they'll sleep in the town square and Lot has a huge oh crap moment, knowing full well that's a terrible idea for reasons that become obvious shortly. Another thing that's interesting is that they all ate bread without yeast. Say, what happens when you don't put yeast in bread? It doesn't rise. You know, like communion wafers at a Catholic church? 
The American Standard Translation refers to it as unleavened bread. It's very easy to write this off as some unimportant detail, but leaven or yeast is symbolic in the Bible for sin and or evil. God does not like yeast, apparently, but what is being communicated to the reader through this detail, this unleavened bread, he is saying that Lot is without sin, or at least the sin of the city. But before they could break out the souffle, an angry mob shows up, yay, and they want to have sex with the men Lot brought. I'll give you three guesses where the term sodomy comes from. Anyway, it's clear that Lot's attempt to let the mob have their way with his daughters, ugh, is an attempt to calm things down, that he would even offer it suggests that he is familiar with the vices of the sodomites and was comfortable with it to not want to freaking leave the city in the first place. Suffice to say, doesn't speak highly of Lot. But to his credit, he has the balls to go out on his own outside his house and try to talk down a crowd of grippy, grappy, rapey maniacs and confront them about their wickedness. That's worth something. The mob didn't take kindly to that. So the angels pull Lot back inside his house and slam the door before they could get to him, while making the raving lunatics outside so blind that they couldn't find his door. What this means specifically isn't completely clear, but I think it's safe to interpret this somewhat literally. So Lot's safe for the time being. So let's take inventory of his family. There's Lot, his wife, and his daughters, all of whom should be saved. Nope, he has sons-in-law, who he needs to warn about the coming disaster tonight. However, it is not to be. They simply mocked his warnings. Wait a second. Sons-in-law? This implies that they were already married to Lot's daughters, or are brothers to the husband. Yet, the girls are virgins. Does this mean that the sons-in-law are themselves caught up in the very depravity Lot is being rescued from, to the point where they've never actually bedded their wives? I wonder if the angels making the mob blind earlier was necessary since they're clearly already blind. Now what does this say about Lot? How long has he lived in the city that he thought wedding his daughters to such men would turn out okay? So anyways, next day rolls around. Rise and shine, it's judgment time. The angels usher Lot and his family out of Sodom and Gomorrah as its destruction was imminent, but they were hesitant and had to be led by force. Once outside, it didn't end there. They were told to go to the mountains and to not look back. But Lot protested, afraid that something might happen to him up in the mountains. Right, because the same God who's strong enough to smash a city and has gone out of his way to protect you totally does not have the ability to protect you from whatever evil may or may not be lurking in those mountains. Yeah, sure. Even when he is literally in the process of saving you from the evil that would have consumed you in Sodom and Gomorrah right now. What am I doing? I can't judge Lot too harshly. I'll explain shortly. Anyways, Lot spots a nearby town called Zor, and manages to convince God to spare it. Huh. He made allowances for Lot's hesitation. God also agrees to protect a nearby town for Lot to find refuge in at Lot's own prayer. That doesn't sound like God being a dick at all. If anything, he's being incredibly patient and flexible. Though Lot spent enough time lingering, the family and he must leave right now. He makes it to Zor when God finally goes BOOM and everything explodes! Hellfire in the sky smites Sodom and Gomorrah. I shouldn't laugh. That's the thousands of deaths. But, eh, pretty cool to imagine. I'm gonna segue a little bit because, as it turns out, archaeologists might have actually found the ruins of the historical Sodom and Gomorrah. Reportedly, it matches all biblical criteria with evidence that it came to a sudden and abrupt end. What's even more interesting is the ancient clay tablet called the Planisphere, which is reported to have a detailing of an eyewitness account of the cities being smashed by a giant meteor. We cannot say for certain, but I think we got a pretty good idea of the precise way God chose to strike down the cities of sin. It was a giant meteor! Next we have Lot's wife, who looks back and becomes a pillar of salt. Now the first reaction to this is, wow, this woman just glances back and is immediately killed? God is a dick. Not quite. Lot's wife lingered back, staring longingly at her old home, being smashed by a giant meteor. She looks back longingly, nostalgically, at her home in a city of depravity of sin. Then she is transformed into a pillar of salt. I wouldn't exactly call it a miracle. I would call it being buried by giant waves of superheated ash and stone. In the later passages, we see it's Abraham who is responsible for Lot's salvation. God remembered Abraham, and by his bidding, Abraham's nephew was saved. So let's tie this all together. Let's start with the Sodomites and the Gomorians. 
Surely being smashed with a giant meteor is a little excessive, right? Yeah, no. If you really think about it, the Sodomites were horrible people. I'm not even referring to the homosexuality. The Sodomites formed a large crowd that encircled Lot's home. That's going to be at least several dozen men of all ages, all assembled to rape two guys. That's a brutal gang rape if I've ever heard of one. But it's not a recent phenomenon in the city, either. The crowd is composed of people of all ages. Of all ages. This is not a recent problem. This is an intergenerational problem. Young kids are being sexualized to lust after their own gender, while old people are on the prowl as well. I should note that in the previous chapter, Genesis 18, 16-32, Abraham pleaded to God to spare Sodom and Gomorrah for the sake of 50 righteous people. Abraham negotiated that number down to 10. 10 good people in the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. And God, in his mercy, accepted that if he would spare that city for the sake of of ten. So what does it say about the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah that freaking God couldn't find ten good people in them? It's gotta be a pretty screwed up place. But also what does this say about Lot? He chose to live there and he offered his daughters to a maniacal crowd. He was hesitant to leave and even went so far as to refuse God's plan to go into the mountains and convinced him to spare a different nearby small town. Yet we are told he is a righteous man. How can this be? Well, I mean, I don't think Lot's a bad guy. He did his best to protect the angels, offer them hospitality, and put himself in danger for their sake. And he tried to save his sons-in-law from the coming cataclysm. But the weakness of his faith comes from his associations. He was in a bad situation. He lived in a dangerous, sinful city so long that he was being transformed by it, coming to accept some measure of its debauchery as normal. It took literal divine intervention to help him escape a bad situation. I think Lot's greatest folly was complacency, was staying and living in that sinful city. Why was he there in the first place? I couldn't say, but the moral is clear, that there are people in this world who will not repent of their ways, they may not necessarily be evil, but the wages of sin is death, and they are engaging in self-destructive behavior that will bring ruin and cataclysm sooner rather than later. God calls on all of us not merely to resist sin, but to disassociate from sin and never look back. Maybe you have a cousin who's having a hard time kicking a drug habit, or a co-worker with a toxic attitude. Maybe you're around paranoid or delusional fools. Maybe they're socialists. At some point, they bring themselves to ruin. And if you are anywhere near them, they will drag you down with them. You must know when to disassociate from bad situations, from bad people, and move on. It's not always easy. Sometimes it's family and friends. But with the grace of God, anything is possible. But more importantly, don't look back. Lot's wife looked back at her former life in that sinful city and it obliterated her. A relapse into sin may be more destructive than the sin itself. Besides, look at what an imperfect human being Lot is. If God can go out of his way to save that guy from the destruction of everyone around him, why can't you be saved? Before I close out the video, let me just thank Placebo Lizard for this glorious fan art. Thank you again, and stay awesome.